our first question today is from Brenda Goodman from Medscape. Hi, Dr. Jaw. Um, thanks for doing this. I have a question about, um, I, I wonder how you feel about mandating Pfizer's vaccine under an EUA for school attendance. Um, and then a uh, second part to that question, we have a large school district in Metro Atlanta where I am um, that has already said they're going to roll back masks one month after the vaccine becomes available to kids. So the clock is already ticking on that. Um, does that kind of a policy make sense to you? Yeah, so let's talk about vaccine mandates uh, for kids. I've been, uh, I've already been asked this a few times publicly and I've said, uh, I don't think it makes sense to have a vaccine mandates for five to 11 year olds right now. Um, look, when we did an, e and it's not the EUA part to me that's such an issue. Um, but when you think about when we did uh, vaccinations for adults uh, in back in December, we did not have vaccine mandates immediately. Uh, we let people choose to get vaccinated or not in the early months. Uh, we really built up a lot more experience. And the, the earliest vaccine mandates you really saw from organ, individual private organizations, uh, public entities like governments, uh, didn't really come for about six months or so. Uh, I, I, that's how I envision what should be happening with children right now is let kids get vaccinated, give parents time to have those conversations with their uh, pediatricians, let people get comfortable with this. That takes some time. Uh, as you, if you've been hurt, if you've been listening to me publicly, I'm pretty pro mandates uh, in specific uh, circumstances. I don't think that's what I would do. I actually do not think that's what we should be doing uh, right now for kids five to eleven. You know, kids twelve to sixteen, we've had more experience and spend more time under specific circumstances. I think that it may be reasonable, uh, but I think as a as a precondition for schools, it's also not. I should not. It's not necessary for it to be a precondition uh, for school attendance. In terms of mask mandates and timelines. You know, as I said, I think it's really about availability and when there's been enough time. A month is not enough. I, I, even a child that got vaccinated today is not going to be fully vaccinated in a month because it's three weeks between doses. And then you need two weeks after that to be fully vaccinated based on CDC criteria. And obviously, kids are not all going to be able to get vaccinated today. There is a, a long line and places are not quite ready. And so I understand that some school districts may want to move quickly on this. And what I would say is give parents time to get their kids vaccinated. Uh, and if we do that, uh, it's going to be a much more reasonable to pull back the mask mandates uh, down the road. Thank you. Next question is from Jeman Lopez from Vox. Hi, uh, thanks for doing this. Um, so I, I had a question about boosters for you, which is just like uh, one of the things I've been wondering is just what unanswered questions people have about them. Um, I mean, what are some of the, like starting with, for example, what is even the point of a, like a booster strategy if we follow one? Like what, what exactly are we trying to accomplish? So, so anyway, along those lines, I'm just curious, what do you think are some of the major unanswered questions around um, booster shots and speaking specifically for adults here? What are the unanswered questions, Herman? Yeah. Well, there's a lot, uh, um, you know, so I'll tell you what I think is really clear in my mind on boosters based on all the data we have. Um, it's really clear to me that uh, certainly people over 40 uh, benefit from a booster uh, six months out. Uh, and that's not what the CDC uh, and FDA have done. They've obviously done over 65 or chronic disease or high exposure uh, work. But there's plenty of evidence, I think, emerging from other countries that the people in their 50s, people in their 40s uh, benefit. The question, one of the questions that's not as clear, remains un unanswered to your question, is what about young, healthy people? And we just don't know. And we don't know. And I, I, I can speculate where I think that will land. But I don't love speculating. I'd love to see the data. And I think that remains an important question. You know, should a 25 year old healthy person who got vaccinated six months ago, uh, should they be getting a booster? We don't know the answer to that question. Um, the second big question we don't know the answer to, of course, is what are the long term uh, benefits of a booster? How long does it last? Will we need another booster a year from now? Will we need another booster sooner than that? My again, there's there's some reasons to believe immunologically uh, that once you get a booster six months after your second shot, that that should have a lot more durability than the first two shots did. Can't prove that. We don't know for sure. We don't have that long-term data. That's, I think, a really important question. 
But the benefits of boosters for the high risk groups, people over 40, people with chronic disease, six months out, to me is really pretty clear. And so while I, I appreciate where we are with the country, uh, with our country in terms of getting high risk people boosted, my guess is we're gonna be expanding that to include more people, uh, certainly people in their 40s and 50s. Excellent. The next question is from Rachel from AARP. Hi, thank you so much for doing this. Um, we've been hearing recent reports about a Delta Plus variant popping up in the UK and now the US. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what we know about this strain and whether it's something we need to be concerned about as we're heading into the colder months, like you mentioned, and especially, you know, still considering only 58% of the population is, is fully vaccinated at this point. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so Delta Plus first popped up in India June-ish, I can't remember, but somewhere around May or June. And it sort of sputtered out and didn't do anything. And so I think people were initially worried uh, and then it really looked like it wasn't gonna be a problem. Delta Plus has shown up in several places uh, in Europe, in the United States, and has never really taken off. Um, it has become more commonplace in the UK. And whenever you see a new strain kind of taking off, there are two potential explanations. I mean, there are multiple explanations potential, but the two most common ones are it's more contagious, so we worry about, or there's a what people talk about as a founder's effect or an epidemiologic kind of advantage that it has, that it hit a population where the infection numbers were going to take off. And there's been a lot of work to try to sort out, is it actually more contagious? And the preliminary evidence, preliminary, suggests that it may be about 10 or 15% more contagious than Delta Classic or Delta Original, right? That, that's an advantage. And that means that over many, many, many months, it may become the dominant feature. The differential between Delta and Delta Plus is much, much smaller than what it was between Delta and Alpha. Alpha was the one that was uh, widespread in the United States in, in March, April, May, uh, before Delta took off. So um, I would not be surprised if Delta Plus eventually ends up becoming dominant, but I, I'm not super worried about it. It's not that much more contagious. And I'm not even convinced that it is more contagious. That's what the sort of very preliminary evidence suggests. The bigger, not bigger question, but another question that's also critical is, is there any reason to think that it's gonna have any more immune escape? And the preliminary data, and again, all of this stuff is preliminary. Uh, the preliminary data out of the UK suggests that our vaccines are holding up just fine. They've tested both AstraZeneca and Pfizer vaccines and have every reason to believe that J&J &J and Moderna will act similarly, that the vaccines are going to hold up fine. So I look at it and think of this as a variant of a little bit of concern, but certainly not anything that I think represents a game changer in terms of our strategy and approach. Great. Thank you. Thank you, indeed. Next question comes from Matt Couture from WLNE. Hi, Dr. Jha. Uh, thanks for taking questions. Uh, just looking forward, uh, some of the medical experts, the medical professionals have talked now about an, an endemic phase of the virus now that the vaccine is going to be available for kids. Uh, my question is, you know, for Americans to move forward, do we see a point where this becomes like a flu in terms of you're sick, you stay home, you feel better, you go back to work? Or how long does the, the quarantine, the mandatory quarantine last, especially with no federal money available for a lot of workers right now? Yeah, it's a really good question, Matt. And um, it raises all sorts of issues because, because there isn't, for instance, sick leave. Uh, if you get the flu, uh, a lot of people still feel uh, pressure to go back to work. And of course, we know that that's not great from a uh, disease spread point of view. And so how do we deal with that with COVID? Let's just talk about the kind of biology and public health issues first. And then I think we can talk a little bit about the policy stuff. Um, we are in a period of time right now where we are moving slowly out of the acute phase of the pandemic that we have been in for the last 19, 20 months, what feels like a decade, um, to, towards a kind of endemic state. We're not quite there yet. We still have high levels of infection. Obviously, a lot of Americans still dying every day. Uh, but we are clearly heading in that transition. We're in that transition phase, and I'd say we're early in the transition towards an endemic state. Once the virus is endemic, there are a lot of different models out there of what that will look like from a 
kind of population point of view. You know, my um, the the models that I have looked at that I sort of trust most, you know, kind of try to factor in a few things: a, an endemic delta, waning immunity among the population, booster shots being given, let's say once a year, um, and some amount of population at risk at any given moment, including people who've not been vaccinated or people who got previously infected and their immunity has waned. And when you put those models together, you have models that suggest that maybe 10 to 20%, maybe as much as 20% of the American people will get infected every year from SARS-CoV-2. That's 60 million people. Now that sounds terrible and it has real implications, we think in a typical year, 10% of the population gets infected by the flu. So why would this be worse? Because it's so much more contagious than the flu, right? This is a dramatically more contagious virus than the flu. And so once it is endemic, I can imagine 20% of the population, even if we bring the mortality rates way, way down, because we've done a terrific job on vaccinations, we're gonna have more therapies, you can still imagine a mortality rate that could rival the flu at about 0.1%. And that means we're talking about 60,000 deaths from SARS-CoV-2 a year. It's a lot. That's a bad flu season. And throw in the fact that just because you have endemic SARS-CoV-2 does not mean that the flu will have gone away. So now you're gonna be dealing with two very serious respiratory infections that America is gonna have to deal with. You know, for those of us who've been practicing medicine for a lot, long time, the, we know that the flu really stretches our hospitals every year for about two to three months. Hospitals are full. We're trying, we're struggling to take care of everybody. And that's with the flu. Throw in SARS-CoV-2 becomes sort of borderline unmanageable. So we're going to have to make some decisions as a society. What are the long-term strategies we want? I think improving in, uh, indoor ventilation is going to be a really important part of that strategy. I think really changing the culture of you know, somebody's super sick, but boy, they're tough. They're going to come into work anyway. We used to love that and be like, that guy's a real trooper. Now we're going to say, oh, that guy's a super spreader and, and he or she it's not you know, it needs to be a guy, but actually needs to stay home. And we've got to have policies that support that. If we don't have those policies, we're not going to be able to have our hospitals and our healthcare system really function during uh, several months of the year when the viruses are circulating together. So there's a lot of work to do to kind of get to a long-term stage where we're going to be able to manage two respiratory viruses every year uh, moving forward. Thank you. The next question is from Amy Birnbaum from CBS News. Hi, thank you for taking my question, Dr. Jha. Um, I want to get your perspective on uh, uh, the, the preparation or how well the U.S. is uh, for this actual rollout to the five, for the 5 to 11 population. Are we equipped to really get the kind of the penetration or coverage that we need? And how do you see it differing from um, the adult vaccination rollout, uh, specifically in terms of venue? Wait, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last couple. How do I see it different from the adult rollout? And then you said something else. Um, specifically in terms of like venue, like where it should, where the best place venue. is Got for a, yep. a childhood. Yeah, like great question, Amy. Um, so I think, first of all, I think in general, it's gone much, much better. Now we'll see what the, the proof is going to be in the pudding over the next couple of weeks. Uh, and I do expect that for the next couple of weeks, there's going to be some backlogs and some challenges. But if you think back to what happened in November, December, uh, really December and January, um, where there seemed to be no national plan. Every state was on their own. Uh, there was all this scrambling and all of this kind of stuff going on in, in, in terms of who could cut in line where. Um, and ultimately got better when we set up mass vaccination sites. Um, this is, th the strategy here is a little bit different. And obviously a chunk of the strategy is to try to get vaccines into pediatricians offices. I think that's right because uh, even, I mean, you know, look, I'm personally very enthusiastic and I would take my kid to a mass vaccination site, but the truth is most parents uh, are going to feel so much more comfortable if it's in the context of where they take their kid uh, for other vaccines. Uh, so I think that strategy is right. I do think for the pent up demand, CVS, maybe even some, some mass sites may make sense for short periods of time, but I don't think they're going to be the major way that we get kids vaccinated. If we do it through pediatricians offices and um, schools, it will take longer. It will draw it out a little bit more, but I think in the long run, it's probably a better strategy. 
Uh, and so in general, I've been pretty supportive of the, of the approach that the administration has taken. Uh, it's still, I think for the next few weeks, for those of us who are anxious to get our kids vaccinated, it's gonna be frustrating. And I expect that some number of parents uh, are gonna are, are gonna wish that it was going faster. Thank you. Thank you indeed. So I wanted to offer the opportunity for anybody who was struggling to find the raised hand to see if there is any questions. Bernie, look, it just this my monitor just suddenly died. Looks like we're good. So then Vishish, do you want to provide us with some closing thoughts? Yeah, I would be happy to. So first of all, thank you again all for coming. Um, this is just an opportunity to kind of, I think, summarize a few of the major issues that are in front of us. Um, you know, I, as I started with, I mean, for me, this is also very personal in the sense that we have, you know, one child at home who is not yet vaccinated with two teenagers who are. And, and so I was paying very close attention to the data that was released, uh, not as much as, I mean, as, certainly as a public health person and as a physician, but very much as a dad. And the data has been on vaccinations for five to 11 year olds has been extraordinarily reassuring. Uh, if we put the whole package together, what we know about vaccinations for 12, 13, 14 year olds, um, what we have seen in the clinical trials, uh, I think most parents should feel, all parents should feel very reassured that the right thing to do for their kids is to get them vaccinated against this highly contagious virus. I'm hoping that will happen. It's great to see that all the medical societies America's pediatricians, family practitioners, everybody uh, really strongly on board. You know, what I, when I talk about that national picture and the plateauing, as kids get vaccinated, uh, kids have been part of the outbreak that we've seen with Delta. As kids get vaccinated, I do think that will also put downward pressure on those uh, infection numbers, will make it easier to get through the holidays. Uh, I think this, the Thanksgiving, Christmas, is, and, and the holiday season is going to look much, much better this year. Uh, certainly any child who wants to be vaccinated over the age of five will be vaccinated by, uh, by the holidays. Uh, and that's going to make for just a safer holiday season for everybody. Uh, so I, I, I feel like we're in a very good spot. Uh, and again, one last thing we talked less about was therapeutics. We do have one drug that hopefully will get an EUA soon, more coming. Uh, all of that means that we can begin to kind of get out of the emergency phase of this pandemic and move into a different, uh, different phase. Uh, where the virus is around, the virus is with us, but no longer dominates our lives. And the good news is I think we are much closer to that than we have been at any other point. Obviously, uh, no one wants to call this too early. Delta was a bit of a curveball, and I think uh, we still have to be careful. Uh, but we are now developing kind of more and more tools to manage this pandemic. And if we apply them effectively, uh, we really can put the acute phase of the pandemic behind us. 